Yeah, thanks a lot to Wikipaka VG for hosting this and uh, for keeping us all awake. Um, so probably it's not wrong to say good morning, everyone. Um, okay, what I would like to do, so this all of this has been announced as a discussion, so um, it's probably no point in me talking to you for something like 55 minutes straight. Um, so I would just like to give you a um, couple of slides um, on what we could discuss and then see where um, we want to go with this one, okay? So um, to start off with, who of you considers to be him or herself to be scientist? Okay, who has the pleasure to work within the European scientific system? Okay, and within the German one? Okay, and uh, so negative control, who knows what the capital of North Dakota is? Okay, so there's no rigor mortis in your arms. Okay, so um, yeah, topic today is um, free software for open science, and um, as I have some association with the uh, Free Software Foundation Europe, um, well, um, we should probably start with the definition for this one. So, uh, number one, what do we consider to be free software? Um, uh, in this one, it's uh, pretty much every software that would be released under an IR, either FSF or OSI compliant license. So, this is what uh, most people know also as an open source. Um, and uh, main point here is, um, so as the FSF and OSI definitions pretty much standardize the same things, that they just have different ways to, uh, to say it. Um, the, um, um, it should be made sure that, uh, that it guarantees the four freedoms to the user. So to use, to study, um, to improve and to share. Um, the piece of software and of course this does require the existence and openness of um, a source code and the ability to actually create derivatives. Okay, so um, and I think for everyone um, who's been working in science it's pretty clear that those four core freedoms are very well aligned with what we're trying to do in science. Okay, we're trying to build up on the work of others and um, to get humanity um, uh, along and increase our overall knowledge. So um, for that reason, um, what we're doing there is exactly that we're exercising those four freedoms, um, just not necessarily that we're doing it in a digital or code-based manner. Okay. So that's the first thing then. Um, what actually is open science? So first of all, open science is a class A buzzword. Um, nevertheless, the European Commission um, took the liberty to get a um, committee in there, in that case the OSPP, the Open Science Policy Platform, and um, those people um, developed um, a lot of bits or paper, however, and um, what they defined is um, eight key areas. Um, they are called, sometimes called ambitions, um, sometimes they are called priorities, which um, is um, the key things that need to be addressed in the midterm to move European science to what they consider to be open science. And um, this is not only, and that's very important, about the classical things that you might know like open access and open data. Open access and open data are basically um, incorporated in here, so scholarly communication. It says future of scholarly communication, um, which can be everything from uh, open access to just uh, go on digital. Um, however, um, we should all be aware that um, European Commission now has endorsed Plan S, um, which is a, a rather far-reaching um, push towards more um, or rather radical program in terms of um, publishing requirements. Um, so we can consider that this part for scholarly communication is really meant to be 
um, uh, open access. Um, and then the other thing, so open data is what is uh, what is called here to be fair data, um, because the um, uh, commission typically tries to avoid the term open, uh, because openness, of course, is not fair, and fair, unfortunately, um, is not open. But um, this is where we lead our discussions. So this means that we only have two of the classical open science points um, that are in here. Everything else are things like um, incentives. So this is how can we generate better um, citation, um, or so how can we make sure that the people who do the work get the credit. Um, so we might need some reform in how we um, do citations. Um, then um, indicators is... Um, was that me or was that... Okay, so indicators is um, uh, kind of a way to try to overcome um, the simple citation indices um, and, uh, of course, especially um, the impact factor. Um, EOSC, for those of you who have not heard that term, that's a very large project. That's the European Open Science Cloud. Um, uh, it's still rather ill-defined what it should be. It's getting better along the way, but the term has been out there for three years. Um, in the end, what this is about is to really create a large federated European um, infrastructure for scientific data. Um, the main funding for that one will come from the national states um, and so for example the German implementation will be, uh, is called NFDE, National um, Research Data um, Infrastructure um, and will be heavily funded by nearly 1 billion euros over the next 10 years so this is the scale um, that we are talking about. Um, integrity means how to assure integrity skills is how to train um, the next generation of scientists um, and um, CS is the um, approbation for citizen science. So with all of this you see that um, what open science is not just trying to do tick marks, what they're really trying to push for um, is a rather fundamental change um, in the way how we do our work um, to what's really becoming a more egalitarian system um, and a more open and participatory system. Okay, so now the question is um, how, um, so what is the role that um, free software can play in this? And so one of the things that we need to define here, are we talking about free software for open science, which is the um, uh, thing that as this talk was announced for, um, but of course we could also, it, that's the general interest to talk about free software in open science um, or in science in general. So distinction would be that the for open science is mainly, here we're talking about software as a research product. So this is mainly domain focused software that is created by the scientists themselves. Um, and um, here we ha then have, of course, um, issues like um, how to sustain it, how to ensure quality, um, and um, how to choose proper licensing for it or licensing models for it. While the in um, science is um, more generally talking about generic software tools, so this is operating system, office suits, and so on, um, that are just used by scientists in more general. In both cases, um, the main point, uh, of course, or, or how um, free software can contribute um, to the scientific endeavor is, um, of course, by promoting uh, the reproducibility because everyone can use these tools. There is no, um, there is no light, um, a pay, a paywall in that case, so you don't need to purchase a given Microsoft Office version um, to uh, recreate an Excel table or something like this. And of course, also the attempt to reduce black boxing. Um, the other thing that is um, more specific for um, uh, free software for open science is the general thing that um, we already said. Okay, so somehow the ideas of free software align well with what you're trying to do in science. But more important uh, question right now is does it fit the policies under which we are operating? And so, of course, the main policy that um, uh, most people know is um, FAIR. So FAIR um, stands for Findable, Accessible, Interoperable, and Reusable. 
and um, it's a kind of a paradigm that was defined, um, so published um, uh, 2016, um, was in the making for a couple of years before that, and um, this is something that was uh, primarily geared towards data. Um, the nice thing about FAIR is that the um, 2016 paper also operationalizes this. So um, they give criteria on what you need to do or what you need to ensure um, that, uh, for example, data set is findable, what it means, how, um, how it needs to be accessible, and so on and so forth. And of course, reuse also says something about, well, you need to put a license on it, but otherwise, um, it's not that specific. Okay, now importantly for this one, um, stuff that is fair does not necessarily align with free software because free software um, means that there are no that there are basically no restrictions in use, while the reusability um, uh, for fair um, simply says um, people somehow need to be able. Um, to, uh, to reuse it. So there needs to be a clear pathway. Um, that can still be a proprietary license. Okay? And um, that um, license might still not allow you to do everything with it. Um, there just needs to be this ability. Um, so that's um, one of the main things where FAIR does not um, fit the, usual, um, uh, the uh, free software definitions. On the other hand, of course, free software doesn't say anything about Oh no, I killed the alpaca. <laughs> okay, I'm probably going to be kicked off the stage any minute. Um, okay, sorry. All right, so um, on the other hand, um, I can write beautiful code and put it under an open source license and put it on a USB stick and bury it somewhere in my garden. Okay, so then it's neither findable nor accessible. Um, and this is of course also something that um, where the classical definitions for free software um, don't necessarily match these two criteria, which nevertheless also for software um, do make sense. Um, finally, one last thing is that FAIR defines a product. So it says, okay, so the outcome of your research needs to comply with different criteria. And that's, of course, a relative easy thing to test. What it does not do, and maybe from a software um, development perspective, this is something that is um, more important. It doesn't define a process how we do things. And this is one of the things that also um, one of the German committees, so the RF, um, RFEE, um, has um, recently um, uh, started to criticize uh, for FAIR, that we say, okay, FAIR data just says this one, but you can have completely rubbish data and it can still be FAIR, but what we want to have is high quality FAIR data. So um, FAIR clearly is some kind of minimal consensus, it's um, a conditio sine qua non, but we probably need to extend it at, set at this point, and of course, with this one, we can also discuss on how we uh, want to continue, how we want to get this into uh, or align this with free software. Okay, so um, that's more or less the brief introduction. Um, now, there are a couple of things that we can discuss further depending on your interest. Um, and um, that would be um, basically what about the current European policies? brief overview, what about the current German policies, uh, what about generic uh, free software tools. But um, maybe that's the point where you could say something um, to get us going a bit. I think it's working now. Uh, you mentioned that the uh, current software standards might not be in line with policies. Um, what were you exactly referring to? C can you repeat this? Um, you mentioned before that um, the current software procedures or standards might not be in line with the policies in, in the European Union. What exactly did you mean by that? So um, the thing is that um, 
the so I can comply with OSI regulations for open source software, but um, none of our funding bodies says you need to be OSI compliant. What they say typically is you should do stuff that is fair. But right now, one of the issues, this is what basically this slide then says, is the question whether um, any of the policy makers really define um, code as a primary research object. And that's right now not the case, so therefore everyone assumes that code behaves like data. And um, to equal code with data is something where some people get cold shivers. Um, others don't because it's, it's an operation that you can do. It's a lossy operation, but it might be. Um, it might help us in some ways. And the main point here is that um, code has some idiosyncrasies that um, make it distinct from data, and this is where our policies break. On the other hand, some of the policies that we came up not for research, but in general, so from the, from the free software perspective that we made up um, uh, there, didn't make it into the policy documents, um, and so therefore are not incorporated there. Okay, so fair criteria um, and the other ones don't completely overlap, so um, most people might write code, but it still wouldn't align with a fair criterion if you would take it one to one. So, so um, a question about uh, the uh, topic at in the start, the licensing. So when we say we have a um, commercial uh, company who, like Microsoft, who develops an Office package, and um, when you say free software for open science, it would uh, be better to like invest the money not into license costs, who are reoccurring, but better for like an um, like a bigger thing like a country to invest more in uh, like open uh, code or like op open uh, programs. Uh, is this kind of like tackled by what you mean with the FAIR or the uh, uh, open source? This is, this is one of the things that um, not is not necessarily... Um, so you, you could construct it in a way that it actually overlaps with FAIR because you're talking about reproducibility. Um, oh well, so okay, FAIR doesn't say reproducibility, but um, it says accessibility. And if you're using formats that are proprietary, you could say, okay, well, this is not accessible to everyone because you need to uh, pay for it. Now, the thing is that there are a lot of things where you have to pay for. So this was one of the things that was never um, on the agenda um, uh, to try to be eradicated. This is, um, so the generic software part is just something that I, um, that came into this whole process later. Initially it was really geared towards the, um, how can scientists make sure that, um, or how, how does the software produced by scientists is both free software and contributes to open science and what do we need to do to um, create potentially additional funding opportunities for, um, because this is where it typically breaks, um, to say, well, I can write better code if I have more man or woman power, um, uh, if I have people who curate, if I have people who do, um, who do issue fixing and so on and so forth, um, which right now is not um, considered part of the research process, but in reality, um, so by the policy makers, but in reality it already has become that. Now, um, if you're saying about well, you're, you're using generic so, um, or generic office suits for that one, then yes, we are investing a lot on, in these things in the in tertiary education and in the research sector. And personal opinion, yes, we should spend this on things that doesn't um, nudge people towards proprietary solutions. Um, but um, the question, the, but that's um, something that is because it, it has a stronger education component, also for student education. So I wanted to bring it up here um, because I thought, okay, maybe it's uh, something that more people here are interested in, but um, I agree that it doesn't overlap completely, um, doesn't strongly overlap with the, um, uh, with the open science part. Hi. Okay. 
I've heard some people work on the FAIR principles specific for software. Yes. You've heard about it and you know what kind of the differences are? Yes, so um, thanks for this input. So let me check. Uh, okay, I missed that one. So um, yeah, there's a recent paper that c just came out a couple of weeks ago by um, so Annalena Lamprecht. She's from the um, Netherlands um, eScience Center. Um, so what they try to do is they um, to use the um, catalog or, or this um, the original criteria, fair criteria, and check for each of those ones does it apply to software, yes or no, and um, uh, then change them, amend them um, in a way to make sure that um, uh, it then well, better fits into the process. So they, for example, say, well, so there needs to be some kind of uh, documented quality control. Um, uh, they're more talking, of course, about software repositories. They then include versioning, which is one of the huge things that um, sets code apart from um, data, which is, once it's released, typically a rather static object. Um, so um, they're trying to get somewhere, and I think it's, it's a good document to start with, but um, in my personal opinion, I think it wasn't bold enough. Um, you might have been, I mean, we had this discussion at the RSE 19 conference also, um, where Annalena also was there, and um, it tries to stick very closely to FAIR, um, because they assume that this is what people know, which I think is good. On the other hand, there's a very clear recommendation from most bodies that FAIR should not be extended. So we don't need, as they say, we don't need additional letters for FAIR. Um, and they really want to have this basically as one concept to stick, on, um, to sti um, to stick with data. Um, so therefore, I think it would have been necessary to have a bolder step um, uh, to to try to work in all the established development policies that we already have, um, then just to stick as close as possible to fair and then just change the um, nitty gritty details, which is what they did. But nevertheless, I think it's um, um, it's something that is clearly worth reading. Uh, thanks a lot for your talk. This resonated a lot uh, with me and. As someone working in research infrastructure, I think it's super important that we focus on uh, um, recognizing uh, research infrastructure, so all kinds of services like uh, uh, sustainable data storage for researchers, tools that help make data um, discoverable and things like that, that this should be considered a public good, right? Yes. And, uh, and so next to what you mentioned, and rightly so with Microsoft, the other risk that I currently see is that legacy publishers like Elsevier, like Springer Nature and so on, um, try to uh, capture the whole market. So this uh, all uh, is, um, um, yeah, trying to um, deliver on all the needs that researchers ha have in the digital area with um, huge platforms. And this is like a battle that we almost uh, have lost already, as it seems. So there are many interesting, very good uh, free and open source alternatives to what they deliver, but it's really not recognized very well why this is so important. This is my impression. Um, yeah, I mean, I would, I would second that. So um, I think and this is, it's interesting to see the large uh, publishing companies now really moving away from their traditional um, uh, business because apparently they have recognized that they might be on a losing path there, but really to offer wholesale data management solutions um, uh, to institutes. Um, I mean, there's, this, this is probably just an anecdote, but so apparently Elsevier offered to, I think, the Netherlands or the, uh, the Dutch government um, to say uh, that they said, okay, we do all of your data management, or basically you get everything for free, um, but um, each and every institution has to deliver, but we become your central data, um, uh, data deposition platform, um, which um, 
Well, unfortunately, it might appeal to some politicians. Um, I think it doesn't appeal to anyone else in this room, uh, given that uh, probably elsewhere is a company that is even more hated than Microsoft. Um, for reasons completely unknown, I mean, they just make a revenue of 35% every year. So maybe we should just buy stock options. Hello, thank you for your talk. Um, what I not completely understand is why we use the FAIR uh, concept uh, for as a point of reference at all, because I, f I feel like this, uh, the concept of open access in science is far more applicable to code. So in the end, code is tax, and it's part of the scientific publication system, so we have references from and to code and such things. So and the, the, the open access, um, yeah, um, yeah, the, the, the concept of open access has the same ancestors like the p scientific publication system with the Mertonian norms of science and such. So why don't, uh, yeah, treat code like uh, scientific publications? Okay, I, I, honestly, I'm, I'm, I'm relatively open to this idea because this is, this is, this is I mean, the reason why we're having this discussion. The, um, mainly, um, what I'm presenting to you now is mainly developed out of the existing EU policies. And EU talks about FAIR a lot. Um, because for them, it's an operationalized thing. It's something that they would like to test. In the end, they, it's something that they would like to score and so on and so forth, so that paper pushers have something to do with. Um, but I agree that we can s simply say, well, um, in the end, the openness is um, more important and FAIR um, as we already said, isn't open. So um, therefore, the open access um, would maybe um, the better point to, uh, to hook this up. So yeah, I agree on that.